Hi everybody, this is Grandmaster Ben Feingold here with the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta with the Queen's Gambit Part 2 lecture. Um, probably we could make this a 10-part series, hint, hint, to the anonymous donor. Um, we want to thank our, our sponsor. Um, he has the same name as most of our sponsors, Anonymous. It's a very common name. I guess if you give, give your kid the name Anonymous when they're born, they're likely to be a donor and a sponsor. Um, Normally, when I lecture in this series that's either on Tuesday or Wednesday, Wednesday now, I show a lot of games and I talk about the games, which I'm also going to do today, but uh, I want to focus on the opening because it's an opening lecture. And as was requested by at least two people by email, they wanted to make sure we looked at the Queen's Gambit accepted. And since... The lecture is only 45 minutes. I think that's all we're going to do. So I want to talk about the opening first and then before we show the games. And when we look at the games, I want to concentrate on the opening, not really delve into the middle game and end game so much. But OK, so the Queen's Gambit accepted um, starts with the move D takes C4. And of course, and we're probably going to see this in one game, maybe, you can always transpose. So sometimes, in fact, it'll even start as a queen's gambit declined and become a queen's gambit accepted. Or you might see another move order like knight f3, knight f6, c4. Okay, and then it's obviously the same thing. But even after c4, if black plays e6 and white plays uh, knight f3, which is a you know, common move, we can still transpose into a queen's gambit. So, accepted. Um, so, Queen's Gambit accepted basically is these pawns are on d4 and d5, uh, and when white plays c4 at some point, black takes it at some point. And, you know, the original version obviously is to take it immediately. Now, <clears throat> what is the point of the Queen's Gambit for white, and what's the point for black to play the accepted? So, in chess, you want to control the center, so if white could move again, then you would probably play e4 here. And so the two most common moves for black are d5 and knight f6, which prevent e4. And so what white would like to do is remove that black pawn from d5, so white plays c4, has very similar ideas to the king's gambit, which is on the other side of the board, which is, I want to get rid of black's e5 pawn so I can control the center more. This is less dangerous because of the king's gambit. White's king can get pretty exposed, as can black's king. Now, accepting the gambit means that black is up a pawn. And there are variations. They're pretty rare where black just keeps the pawn the whole game. That could happen. It's unlikely. Now, before we delve into the, you know, the niceties, I have a funny story. There was a 2000 player in Michigan, and he went to the bookseller at the tournament that I was at. This is at least 20 years ago. And he bought a book on the Queen's Gambit. Okay, I think the book was on the Queen's Gambit Accepted. Anyway, he read the book um, between rounds. He was reading the book, and then he was paired, and he played the Queen's Gambit Accepted right after he read the book. And the game went like this, and this is something that I learned when I was like six years old, five years old, is that in this position, queen f3 is winning for white. You're attacking the rook, and black has to give away material to, you know, not lose his rook. So, of course, the 2000 player who had the black pieces, this is what happened to him. And he was playing somebody like 1870, and the game ended in a draw. Like, black gave up a piece. Maybe he played knight c6 and bishop d7. Queen went back. And somehow the game ended in a draw later, okay, because they're both such good players. But I like the way the most basic opening trap that I learned when I was a small child, that's what he fell into. So I guess he didn't read the niceties of the book. He didn't, you know. Um, now, the reason that I play e3 on move three, which is this move when I'm white, is 
Uh, a lot of the openings that I learned, I learned when I was a small child. And when I was a small child, I didn't want to be down material, ever. And I was like, well, if they take that pawn, how do I win it back? So if I play something like knight f3, which is a very common move here, some of the variations, black, black tries to keep his pawn. So I, I attack the pawn right away, and obviously if black tries to keep the pawn the way that I just showed, you know, white has that winning trap. So now again, a lot of these things transpose. So it could be that it goes knight f3, knight f6, e3, and that's going to transpose into white playing e3 right away. Now the other way to play for white, and when I say the other way, I mean white playing e3 eventually. It could be now, like when I do it, it could be later. The other way to play is e4. So that seems like the way that you should play because that's why you played c4 was to get rid of the d-pawn for black so you could play e4. And we're going to look at games with e3 and e4. Obviously the lecture is only 45 minutes, so we're not going to look at a thousand games. And this is actually the game Feingold Anand from 1986. And one of the main practitioners in the last 20 years of the Queen's Gambit accepted for black is Anand. Um, and many other people have played it also. Almost all the top players in the world have played it with black at one point or another. And most of the top players in the world have, have played white in the Queen's Gambit. So we have a lot of good players on both sides. Um, now e4 has the advantage of the, the pawns are nice in the center. My bishop's not blocked like it is with the pawn on e3, but the e4 pawn can be attacked and the d4 pawn isn't as defended as much as if the pawn was on e3. So it's a, it's a different kind of game. Okay, and if white doesn't play c4, and a lot of people nowadays are playing the London with white and playing other Trompowski, all kinds of stuff. So that doesn't put pressure on the d5 pawn, so black has more options. And after c4 takes on c4, it's very interesting for me because when I look at an opening, I try to figure out which side usually knows more theory. And this is a tricky one because if you only play the queen's gambit accepted with black, if that's all you do against d4 and c4, and your opponent is facing the queen's gambit declined, and they're facing the Slav, and they're facing the Chagorin, and they're facing other openings where black doesn't play d5 on move one, like the Nimzo Indian or Grunfeld or King's Indian, then black should know more about the opening than white, because black's only playing the Queen's Gambit accepted against d4, and white is only facing the Queen's Gambit accepted a limited amount of time, only when their opponent plays it. However, if you have white in the queen's gambit accepted, like I do, then you should have a line prepared. Okay, you're not going to look at every legal move in every position and then just play all of them. You're going to play one line and you're going to know it well. Whereas your opponent who has black has to know all the lines. They have to know how to face e3, how to face e4, how to face knight f3, and they might do different things against those. So it's not clear to me which side usually knows more theory. Okay, and I try to avoid theory, but that, that doesn't help me. All right, so the Queen's Gambit accepted is white says, get your pawn out of there so I can play in the center and your pawn's not in the center. And for a beginning player, there's probably some hope if you're black that you're gonna be a pawn up the rest of the game. You took a pawn, maybe white's not gonna win it back. But top players generally don't try to keep their pawn, they try to get quick development and attack the center. And as in all Queen's Gambits, this is a Queen's Gambit lecture, even in the Queen's Gambit declined, black is gonna play either c5 or e5, usually not both, but one of them to attack white center while white is getting his pawn back as we'll see in the games that we're looking at. 
which is Cord Ileskas Cordoba versus Anand. Okay, so come on. All right, so Queen's Gambit accepted, which is one of Vichy's favorite openings. He started playing it later in his career. I think in his teens and 20s, he wasn't playing it. Then in his 30s, he sort of started. Okay, so uh, Ileskas played knight f3, which is a very common move. And the reason it's common is people who play knight f3 normally want to play e3 like I do, but they want to avoid e5, which I don't want to avoid. So that's, you know, I'm an outlier. So obviously you can't play e5 now because the knight can take it. But if you play e3 like I do, sometimes I face e5. It happens. Um, and again, when I learned the queen's gambit, I was a small child and I was afraid if I played knight f3, my opponents would try to hang on to their C pawn since I'm not attacking it yet. So they could play like either A6 and B5, or they could play C6 and B5, and I'd have to be a pawn down for a while, or maybe forever, and get compensation, which wasn't, that's not what I do. Um, now, I don't really mind the E5 lines personally, so it doesn't, it doesn't bother me to play E3 here. Okay. So a non played a6, that's very common. And after e3, it's actually very rare for black to play b5 and try to hold on to his pawn because in the end it probably won't work and then black's not developing his pieces or controlling the center. He's trying to hold on to a pawn. And sometimes if you do hang on to the pawn, you still have a bad position because you don't have any development. And after b5, white would play a4 and you know, try to get his pawn back. But that's, that's such a rare thing that black plays b5 here, um, and he played knight f6. Now, the reason to play a, a6 is you are going to play b5 later. And with all queen pawn openings, especially the queen's gambit, whether it's declined or accepted, black is always wondering what to do with this bishop. And in the variations where white's playing e3, uh, uh, black can either play bishop g4 at some point, or black can fianchetto his bishop. And grandmasters, about 95% of the time or more, prefer to fianchetto their bishop. So one of the reasons black is playing a6 is he's waiting for white to take on c4. He can play b5 attacking the bishop and then fianchetto his bishop. That's very common, and we'll see that. And that happens in other queen pawn openings also. Sometimes in other queen pawn openings, black doesn't play a6, b5, but just plays b6, bishop, b7. But in the queen's gambit accepted, since the white bishop is almost always on c4, instead of a white pawn, a6 and b5 is much more common. Okay. So we play e6, which means black's not going to play bishop to g4 ever. In fact, that would be a mistake here to play bishop g4 because uh, white would play bishop takes f7 check and knight e5 check. And that's a trick that you should not only know in the queen's gambit, but in a lot of openings you'll, you'll see this kind of uh, fork trick. Okay, so he played e6, Anand did, and then c5. Now again, earlier in the lecture, I said black is going to try to play either c5 or e5. Well, if black plays e6, that's going to be c5. And you want to put pressure on white center and not just let him have a free center. Okay, bishop e3 is an interesting move. I've played bishop to d3 with the same idea is I don't want b5 to come with tempo. So you, you can play either move. Or you can just let black play b5 and attack your bishop. And some people, including me, have played a4, which stops b5, but you're giving away the b4 square. So the bishop can go there later, or the knight can go there later. And a lot of times, you want to control that square with a3. So a4 is not very common. I've played a4, I've played bishop d3, I've played queen e2. Okay, and I'm played knight c6. And a lot of times, when you fianchetto your bishop with b5, bishop, b7, you want your knight on d7 so it doesn't block the bishop. 
So a non-displaced knight c6 putting pressure on the center. And after queen e2 takes, white plays the standard in the queen's gambit accepted when they take early, rook to d1, pinning the pawn to the queen. Okay, and black can play d3 if he wants to get a symmetrical pawn structure, but Anand just played bishop e7, and if white wants to play for an advantage, it's almost always right to take the isolated pawn position, because sometimes the pawn goes to d5, sometimes the knight goes to e5, and with the pawn not on e3, our bishop can get out. So it's more boring if white just takes on d4 and doesn't get an isolated pawn and keeps the pawn structure symmetrical. That's more of an equal kind of position. This is more interesting. Okay, and Anand played knight a5, which is probably never a move that I've played in the queen's game, but with black, um, normally, when black wants to maneuver his knight, he's looking to play knight b4 to d5 to blockade the isolated pawn. So knight a5, I think, is a little unusual. Obviously, he wants to take the bishop, so bishop to c2. And then he plays b5. So Anand's idea is, I'm going to get c4 for my knight, and when the bishop goes to b7, the knight's not blocking it. So a very specific idea. Knight c3, bishop b7. And black has all of his minor pieces out, and he's doing that instead of just castling immediately, he's getting his pieces where they're on good squares. And basically, if you have the black pieces, every move in these isolated pawn positions, you make sure that d5 doesn't win. And in fact, in the 1970s, Karpov lost two games with black to the move d5 in different positions when d5 was crushing. So players today know that white might play d5, and you can see Anand has a lot of guys defending d5. So when your opponent has an isolated pawn and they can get rid of it and open the position, you have to make sure that's not advantageous to them. Okay, knight e5. Anand again doesn't castle. He gets his pieces out. a3, stopping black from playing b4 with a tempo. And finally he castles. Okay, now in this position, Ieskos came up with the wrong plan and ended up losing the game pretty quickly. It's almost like Anand is the better player. And he played super aggressive, rook to d3, a rook lift. He's going to move his rook over to the king's side, and he's going to checkmate Anand like it's nothing. Okay, no problem. Now... If Ieskos was my student, and he's much stronger than me, so he's not my student, I would tell him, you can't start attacking over here until you developed your pieces. The rook on a1 is no good. The bishop on c1 hasn't moved. It's too early to do that. Black has all of his pieces out, and he has a rook on the open line. So rook d3, that shouldn't work. You shouldn't just checkmate your opponent, and Anon did nothing wrong. Okay, and I'm played knight c4. That's why he played knight a5. Knight's good on c4. And rook to g3 is a sacrifice that doesn't work. Um, what's funny is the person who annotated this game <laughs> that I saw, I deleted his notes. He said rook b1 is the best move. There's a move I would almost never consider. And I assume his reasoning is white has to get his bishop out, but you don't want to give your pawn away here. So rook b1 defends the pawn, then the bishop can get out. I assume that was the idea. Okay, so rook g3 super aggressive. And in 1997, which was probably before some of you were born, Anand was a really good calculator. And he didn't look at moves and get scared of them. He just looked at moves and calculated them. And then if it was good for him, then he played that. If it wasn't good for him, then he didn't. Um, so obviously, if you have the black pieces, you'd probably be worried about bishop h6. That seems pretty scary. Okay? But rig g3 is a pawn sacrifice, and Anand calculated that it was good for him, so he took the pawn on d4. This happens sometimes in the queen's gambit accepted when white gets an isolated pawn, 
Sometimes he blunders it, and sometimes he sacrifices it, depending on who wins the game. Okay, and Yeskos played bishop to h6. This is another sacrifice, because the knight on e5 isn't defended. Now, of course, if we go back a few moves, when the knight was on f3, this pawn was super defended. So because of knight e5, he undefends his pawn once. Then when he plays rook g3, he undefends his pawn again. And now the knight on e5 is attacked. So, um, I mean, I don't know if Yeskos miscalculated. He played bishop h6, and the nun's like, okay, thanks for the piece. And it's good to take with the knight because if this bishop ever takes the pawn, threatening some kind of discovered attack, black has knight g6, which, I mean, stops white's attack forever. That's total blockade on the king's side. So he took with the rook, king h8, and black is up a piece. So if white has a winning attack and Anand sees that, then he wouldn't go into this. But Anand thought, white doesn't have a winning attack and I'm up a piece. I'm not sure what Ieskos thought. I don't know if he missed something or he thought this is too dangerous for black. There's no way he's going to go into it. I don't know. A piece is a piece. And for grandmasters, normally they don't sacrifice material on speculation. They, they figure it out and either it's good or it's not. They don't just say, yeah, I have an attack. I hope it works. That's unusual for a, a stronger player to do. Okay, Iaskos attacked the queen, rook to d1, getting his last piece into the game after he sacrifices, which is, which is weird. Queen c5, because we have to defend our knight. So the queen defends the knight. And now rook to d5, what an amazing move. And I wonder if Ieskos saw this when he played his peace sacrifice on e5. And the idea is he's stopping the queen from defending the knight on e5. He wants to take with the queen, and then his queen's lined up with the king. And that's exactly what happened. Now, you can't take with the knight on, on f6 because that's defending h7. Notice the bishop on c2. So then white would have at least a perpetual, if not more. So he takes with the bishop. Queen takes. Now, white has a really big threat in this position that wins the game immediately. Can somebody unmute themselves and tell me what the threat is? What's white threatening right now? Rook h7. Rook h7. The knight is pinned. So king g8, queen g5 mate. So rook takes h7. King g8, checkmate. And maybe Ieskos saw all of this. I don't know. I don't know. I didn't talk to him. I have talked to him, but it was before this. Was it before this game? Yeah. I played Ieskos in 1989. So I couldn't talk to him about the game because it didn't happen yet. So he has a good excuse. So rook h7 is a huge threat, and it's not easy to stop. But again, this was in 1997 when Anand was just maybe the best calculator in the world. Maybe Kasparov wouldn't agree with that. Maybe. Um, and I think Anand must have figured this out. Or maybe Anand was lucky and didn't see rook d5. And he's like, wow, rook d5. Pretty interesting. Okay, so I don't know. Again, I, you know, I have spoken to Anand since this game, but I never talked to him about it. Um, well, the game's almost over, but again... The things that you should be worried about for this lecture, the Queen's Gambit accepted, is the typical kind of moves you see. This is a typical isolated pawn position that I would get in the Queen's Gambit accepted if I was white. And hopefully, I wouldn't go totally crazy sacrificing trying to win the game. Sometimes I do. My opponents generally aren't as good as Anand, so sometimes when I make an unsound sacrifice, I win anyway. Maybe my opponent doesn't see rook h7, so I look like I'm a genius. And instead, white didn't look very good because the game only went one more move. Anand played a perfect defense, and Ieskos resigned. So what move did 
did Anand play in this position? Again, if you say the answer, make sure you unmute yourself, otherwise we won't know. How do you stop rook h7 check? Is it bishop e4? Right, and possibly bishop e4 is the only move. I don't see another move. You can't play knight e4 because then you're unleashing the queen on your king. So I'm guessing Anand saw bishop e4 way before this and that Ieskos never saw it. It's my guess. It's a strange move because white's defending e4 quite a bit. So it looks crazy, but black is already up a rook, and now the queen on e5 is attacked. So that's, that's the end of white's attack. White's just going to be down a lot of material now. There's, there's nothing he can do. So he's down a rook right now, and bishop e4 either forces a queen trade or I'm going to win this bishop. Yeah. So in this position, he resigned. I probably wouldn't have resigned. I probably would have played for one last trick. I, I probably would have played queen g3 and hoped that my opponent doesn't see rook h7 check, queen g7 mate. Got to hope for something. If he does see that and play something like bishop g6, I guess I'm, I'm out of tricks. You know, you try. Probably rook g8 also wins. but And probably knight h5 wins. See, probably everything wins. But, okay. But I, I wouldn't have resigned. I would have tried. And after bishop e4, since black's up a rook and white isn't mating anymore, he just gave up. So that was a bad tactical sequence for white. But he was attracted by this big attack, which unfortunately didn't work. And... Most of the games that you guys see when somebody's attacking are brilliant victories. So you see an isolated pawn position, white sacks a piece or two and gives main, and everybody's like, yay. Here, white did that, and a non-defended correctly, and then white gave up. So, truth hurts. I have a question about, like, earlier in the game. Um, yes. So if this, like, bishop h6 idea is no good, like, what should white mm -hmm. be doing with the dark square bishop here? Right, so... The whole idea of rook d3 is to sacrifice the d-pawn and move over to g3 or h3, and that, that doesn't work. So I think in this position, before black has played knight c4 and attacked this, there's a choice of playing either bishop f4 or bishop g5. And both are played in these kinds of positions, but I usually like to play bishop g5 because sometimes I'll take this knight and put pressure on h7. Um, and on f4, which, which is also possible, sometimes I like to play bishop e5, but my knight's already on e5. So if I was white here, and I played the same way earlier, I'd probably play bishop g5. On the other hand, typically I don't play knight e5 so early, like, like the guy with white did, yes, Gus. I would get my bishop out first. And then I would try to figure out whether I want to play knight e5 or not. So, but, yeah, I mean, bishop g5 or f4 are both reasonable squares. And then you could put your rook on c1. And your rooks would be on good squares. This is fine. Everything's fine. And basically, white got way too aggressive, probably because he saw this knight on a5 and thought, okay, I can attack on the king's side because my bishop is pointing that way. And obviously... Moves like rook d5 and bishop e4 that were played in the game are, are hard to see. So it could be that some people miss some stuff. Um, and it's also possible that rook g3, bishop h6 was good. And white had a winning attack. But it turned out it wasn't. And if that was the case, if white could just play rook d3, rook over, bishop out and win, black would have to play differently earlier because then this wouldn't be acceptable. But yeah, to answer your question, bishop can go to either square. And occasionally, people just leave their bishop on e3, but that's to defend their d-pawn, which is very passive. And the d-pawn doesn't really need defense now, and Ieskos went too far and just totally undefended it. So that's... Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. All right. Yay, f11 worked. 
Everything's fixed. It still says Yeskas Ananda. I said no. Okay, it says that, but it's a different game. That's interesting. Okay, well. Um, I want to see what the next game is, though. So I'm going to go to the next game instead. And I will share screen to that, that, to that thing, to whatever that was. Um, okay, it is sharing that. Okay. Okay, so this is Benjamin Bach, and he's white against Jeffrey Zhang. This was played last year in St. Louis. Um, now, Benjamin Bach is the strongest Benjamin in the world, which is crazy. And uh, Jeffrey Zhang is even stronger. So there you go. And they played uh, differently to start. Knight f3, d5, but they transpose. And this is a very common that if it's a queen's gambit declined or a queen's gambit accepted, it's not necessarily d4, d5, c4. Sometimes it just becomes that. And when Karpov played Korshnoi in 1978 in their match in Baguio City, I believe, a lot of the queen's gambits actually started with Korshnoi playing c4 on move one. And then after c4, Karpov would play e6 and then play d5, and they would transpose to a queen's gambit. That was very common. Okay, d4, c4 takes. Back to the queen's gambit accepted. Okay, e3 again. He played e6 instead of a6, but again, it transposes. c5, this is still the, still the game we were looking at before. And now b3, uh, bishop b3, was, was played by Yeskas Cordoba against Anand. Benjamin Bach wants to fianchetto his bishop. And since black almost always fianchettos his bishop when he plays e6, we're going to get a symmetrical type of position. And both sides fianchetto their bishop. White plays a4, which is common when black plays b5, and black usually plays b4. Now there's an argument... And there's no answer to the argument, which is, is this a good pawn on b4 because it stops white from using these two squares and it gains space and it makes this pawn not be able to move. Maybe you'll take the pawn later. Or is it bad because this pawn's weak and we're giving the c4 square away uh, to white so white can play knight d2 to c4? And the answer will be shown when the game is over. That's what the players are going to fight for. And if you play a4 with white to attack the b-pawn, like white just did, you don't want to play knight c3 first. That's why the knight's still on b1. If the knight was on c3, it would be attacked. So white purposely never played knight c3. He waited for b4, and now he can play knight d2 to c4. Now the knight doesn't have to move from c3 to some awkward square. You could imagine if white's knight was on c3 now and black played b4, the knight would go to a2 or b1. So it's better not to play knight c3 if black's going to play b4. So knight d2. And the position's very similar, except this pawn's on b4, this pawn's on b3. So black has more space there. Black is controlling c3 and a3 but white's controlling c4. This bishop is putting pressure on this diagonal, and this bishop is defending two pawns. So it's arguable who this is better for. So that's about equal. Okay, castles, that goes to c4. And now we have a big decision to make, a really important decision. Does white want an isolated pawn, like in the last game, or does white want to take with a piece? And actually, when white fianchettos his bishop with b3, bishop b2, he almost never wants an isolated pawn here. He wants the open diagonal. However, if the bishop's on c1 and it can't get out, then he wants the isolated pawn so his bishop can get out. So he took with the, with the bishop, he took with a piece. So 
again, the pawn structure is relatively symmetrical and probably I would prefer white because I like my knight on c4 and I would just hope that black can't take advantage of, you know, my, my weak b3 pawn and the fact that I can never go to c3. Okay, knight d5. And again, this isn't the opening anymore. This is the middle game. But you see these kinds of positions in Queen's Gambit accepted because when at the Grandmaster level, when Black's playing the Queen's Gambit accepted, often he's playing c5 and taking on d4, as we saw in both games. And by developing his pieces quickly, which both sides did, we get sort of an equal kind of position where, you know, it's nobody has a big advantage. Both sides have good pieces. And with correct play, it will be a draw. And if you're the higher rated player, then and you have the black pieces, you don't want to have a slightly worse position or a worse position. You want to have equal footing and outplay your opponent. Okay. And the reason I like this game, I mean, I like Jeffrey, I, I like Benjamin Bach too, is there were two brilliant tactics this game that aren't really related to the opening. But this kind of position um, is a common kind of position when both sides feed and kettle their bishop. And I do that sometimes, but when I have the isolated pawn, then to answer your question again from earlier, then I like to put my bishop out here, usually g5. Okay, and then usually there's lots of trading. Everybody's trading everything. Always trade everything. And in this position, surprisingly to me, Jeffrey took the isolated pawn, and the reason was very interesting. Because after the knight moved away, he played rook c3. He's taking advantage of the fact that his pawn's on b4, and he has c3 available. So that's not something I would have done with, with black, but Jeffrey's a much stronger player than I am. And I think if Jeffrey was playing somebody higher rated than himself, or he needed a draw, he wouldn't have played this way, but I think he felt like he was the better player and he has to make the game interesting and outplay his opponent. Obviously, he wants to take this pawn on b3, then he has a pass b pawn. Okay, knight c6, the knight's defended by x-ray. The rook is defending the knight if you take it. And then he played knight to d4. Now, in this position, We'd like to play rook takes and then win the guy's queen, but we have a back rank issue. We, we don't have time to do that. Um, and if you, if you uh, trade first, rook takes c3, pawn takes c3, and then take this with the idea of winning the queen, then your knight's not defended anymore. So it doesn't work. So all those tactical tricks don't work. So you just play knight d4, He's blockading the d-pawn, and he's defended his b-pawn. So with no tactics, I would assume that white's better here. White's got the blockading knight. The d-pawn is weak, but that's why Jeffrey is Jeffrey, and we're more not. The, that tactic wouldn't work, though, right, even if there was no back rank. You still take the knight with the queen. Right. It would, yeah, it, 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 would, it would never work. Right, yeah. Nothing ever works. Okay, so knight d4, bishop d6, and I'm sure Benjamin Bogg didn't see this. Even when it happened, he might not have seen it. Um, after he moved his queen, Jeffrey played a really nice tactical trick here. Um, yeah, it has to be done in this move order, too. Amazing. And I, uh, if you miss a tactic like this, which White obviously did, when I teach, always look at checks and captures. And this move is a check and a capture. So it's the first move you look at. Bishop h2 check. And the idea is, if you take with the king, which he did not do, queen c7 check. And we're also attacking the rook. The truth hurts. So I'm guessing when he played knight c6 to d4, he just didn't see bishop d6. 
Bishop takes h2 check. Now, if he did see that, I guess he can play queen h4 here. Yeah, queen h4 should, should not lose. Yeah. Probably black's better because black can double rooks on the c file, and he's really taking advantage of the weakness of this square. He's going to dominate the c file. This pawn's going to be weak. So if I can ever capture that knight with my bishop, the b3 pawn's hard to defend. Okay, so he took the pawn, and he didn't take the bishop because he didn't want to lose the queen c7 check. And then the very end of the game was a really nice tactic also. Now black's just a pawn up. Now he's two pawns up. Now he's one pawn up. Okay. And I like the end of the game, the, the very, very, very end. Again, not related to the opening, but... Yeah. So in this position, Jeffrey played a really nice move to finish the game. Let's see who can unmute and solve it first. Black to play. Rook A1. Rook A1, very good. Yeah, when your opponent plays Rook A1, you know it's not your day. So this is attacked, and this is attacked, and so forth. As has been said many times before by many different people, Jeffrey's good. Je Jeff Jeffrey Zhang is really good. We've known he was good since he was about 11, but now he's top 40 in the world. So, yeah. Go Jeffrey. Okay, so those were two wins from black, and we'll finish the lecture with a white win, because otherwise it's not fair. Got to have seen, you know, I got to be fair. All right, let's see if it changes the name. It still didn't change the names. It's so mean. All right, well, I want to change the names. Rawr. So I'm going to do it myself. Okay. And do you guys see this? Well, actually, you don't know, I guess. I don't know what you guys see. Chose Let's make sure you see it. Okay, good. Okay, so this is Salav Ivanchuk. And I've, I've talked about this a lot on the Internet. The story of Valery Salov is a very sad one. Valery Salov was one of the most talented players in the world, and he was top 10 in the world, and he was great, and he played really great chess and had good results against you know, Karpov and Kasparov. And, I mean, he lost it. He, um, he didn't like the chess world. He didn't like the way things were done. You know, prize structures the fact that certain people had more power than others and so forth. So he just stopped playing chess, which is very sad because he's so good. Um, now, this is a game against Ivan Chuk, um, and this is a rapid game played in Tilburg 94. Now, I met Salov in 1988. In 1988, Ivan Chuk was unknown, and it was February 88, and a friend of mine asked Salov, Who's good in the Soviet Union, but we don't know yet. We're going to know later. It's, it's, you know, they're hiding him. And he said, Ivanchuk's pretty good, and we never heard of Ivanchuk. The next month, Ivanchuk won the New York Open. And then Ivanchuk became Ivanchuk. So, but yeah, Salov knew Ivanchuk would become good uh, before he was famous. So this is Salov Ivanchuk. Come on. And you can see it's not the normal move order, but Queen's Gambit accepted. And Salov played a very early Queen E2. Now, when you play Queen E2 early, you have a very specific reason. Now, black can take on D4, but if he doesn't, then white wants to take on C5, but not trade queens. And nowadays, a lot of people are taking on C5 and trading queens. And sometimes they win. Sometimes, but Salah doesn't want to trade queens, so he gets his queen off of d1, and the idea is to play very quick uh, e4, which he didn't do right now. Uh, he still didn't do it. Okay, and I want to tell you a story. At the New York Open one year, I don't know, 30 years ago maybe, uh, there was a tie for first between Yasser Sarawan and Andre Zadorian 
who was a Hungarian grandmaster. He wrote the famous chess book, Black is Okay. And in that game, at some point, Adorian played e4 very quickly, and Serwan responded with e5. And if I remember, I'm pretty sure it was castles, knight c6, e4. And Yasser played e5. This was a playoff for first place. They played a two-game playoff. This was game one. And Adorian played here, bishop f7, because e5 is a blunder. And then if king takes f7, you check and win the bishop. So Yasser lost that game, but then he won the next game, and then he won whatever the Armageddon game was, so he won, got more prize money, I don't know. Um, okay, but that didn't happen here. He played queen c7. Now the bishop on c5 is defended, so, all right. Knight d2, knight c6. And he retreated his bishop to d3, which is unusual, but he's, again, stopping b5 with tempo, and he's controlling e4 more. Bishop e7, and he fiancados his bishop. Okay. And Ivanchuk plays bishop d7, which is... I don't want to say it's, it's very rare, but it's, it's very passive. Um, it's strange to want your bishop on d7 instead of fiancadoing it where it's you know, controlling the board. That's just like, okay, I got to put my bishop somewhere so my rooks are connected. But this is just clearly better for white. White's bishops are both better than black's bishops. I mean, so I don't like this move bishop to d7. Again, I told you white has to win one game. So, okay, rook c1, putting the rook on the same file as the black queen. Good. Rook c8, knight e4. Black doesn't want doubled pawns on f6. So he moves his knight. He could take on e4 as well, but then his king doesn't have a lot of def defenders. So. Knight e5, Salov takes advantage of the pin on the knight. And maybe he wants the two bishops. Or maybe he wants to sacrifice and mate him. I don't know. Okay, bishop e8. Now probably three or four of you were wondering, why did Ivanchuk play this rook to c8 and not this rook? And this is the main reason, is with the bishop on d7, you generally want to play bishop e8 so it's out of the way of these files, so you can use your rooks, and you defend the f7 pawn. And if your rook is on f8, you don't, you don't want your bishop on e8, you want your rook to get out of there so it can be on these open files. So the bishop on e8 defends the king's side, defends the queen's side, and it gets out of the way of the rooks, um, so that's sort of a typical idea when you play bishop d7, but again, it's very passive. Black's not playing aggressively. Okay, takes, opening up the bishop on b2. Queen g4. It's the one move you guys understand as well or better than I do. Queen g7 mate. White's threatening mate in one. g6, stopping the mate. Bishop c4. And here, Salov has a very specific idea. He wants to get rid of this knight so he can put something on f6. And I'm guessing if black plays f5, that white can just... He didn't play f5. Yeah, he played queen d8. f5 is a fork, but I don't think that works. Because... Uh, I was thinking I could play queen h3, queen e6. Yeah, I, I can do that. Then if you take this, this looks like black's just going to lose. Yeah. And then bishop takes knight, and this is pinned. And, yeah. All right. So this is, this is a disaster. Okay, so he played queen to d8, which defends f6, defends his knight, and gets his queen off of this file with the rook. Pretty good defense. Rook d1, pinning the knight again, takes the knight, takes the rook, he takes with the queen, so his bishop's not pinned anymore, and now we can get our bishop on f6. Okay, so strategically, black's just losing, because this bishop is a monster. Um, even if you don't get checkmated on g7, black's king is never going to play in the game. 
Black's king is going to just be sitting there the whole game. The bishop on f6 can't be dislodged. So strategically, black's already in a lot of trouble. Ivan Chuk tries for counterplay. Queen d4, keeping the bishop and the rook defended. Stopping the bishop on d5 from moving, because queen here would be mate. c8. h3 getting luft, good. h5 trying to get luft. Okay, and Ivanchuk played queen e1. He wants to play rook c1. He doesn't want this queen to move away because he's going to take the rook. That's why he played his queen on e. And also, he doesn't want Salov to play e4 attacking the bishop. The bishop moves, and we give a checkmate. That would be pretty cool unless you had the black pieces. Then it would suck. For example, queen f1 threatening checkmate. E4, queen d8 check, and mate. Okay, so Ivanchuk stopped e4 with queen e1. So his queen is stopping this. His queen's on these two. And maybe, maybe black's going to mate white. Okay. Queen f4, sacrificing his rook. Because if you take the rook, then queen h6 is unstoppable mate. So this is looking good. So I guess black has to play king h7, but he's still losing. He played bishop takes g2. He's threatening queen h1 check, and then queen takes h3 is made or winning. And the idea behind bishop takes g2 is if you take it, which he did, I take the rook, and now... Because the king is on g2, I have this check. See, I see, oh, oh I didn't see that move. Oh. I, I thought I saw another way to win, but I'm wrong. Only Salov's way wins. Yeah. What are you guys suggesting? How does white get out of the checks? F3. Never play F3. Even if it works, don't do it. F3 opens up the seventh rank. So the rook can come down, the queen can come down, then the king doesn't have enough shelter. I thought king g3 won, because I saw queen d6 check F4, but actually after king g3 there's h4 check, which I didn't see. And then the white's king is, is it can't escape, just too exposed. You do. What Salov did was really nice. You do like king h2 first and then try f4? King h2, que queen. Yeah, but then you're opening the yeah. seventh rank yeah. again. And then, you, then you're going to lose. Mm. And you got to watch it. No, what he did was really nice. Obviously, he saw it before it all happened. It must be nice because you guys can't find it. So wait, can you play like e4 and then after king takes go like king g3? You don't have like king d6 check. You're fifty percent right. That's the most I could have hoped for. E4 is correct, and now you should always put it in h. Now king if h2. you play king g3, I can play h4 again or uh, rook c3 doesn't work. You know king g3 also wins I think because after h4, then you play king h2. But you just play it now. Yeah, that's the end of that. Yeah, now there's all kinds of checkmates. There's this one, this one. So Black resigned. And then Salov quit chess. Terrible. Ivanchuk still plays chess. Ivanchuk's older than I am, if that's possible. Yeah, Salov was a great talent, as you can see. And um, he just got mad at the chess world and didn't want to be part of it anymore. So he's not. It's unfortunate. Um... But yeah, I mean, that's another lecture. I think I have lectured on Salov. Okay, so in the Queen's Gambit, it's very common. Well, in the games we looked at, Black played c5 in all the games and wanted to take on d4 and get an equal kind of position. And the better player in those games won. You know, somebody outplayed their opponent, and they won because of the middle game and the end game. But I would say in, in almost all of the games, after, you know, 8, 10, 12 moves, the position's about equal. And 
Anand's been playing the Queen's Gambit accepted for a long time, and he, and he does fine. Since Anand usually plays e4, um, he plays d4 also. He doesn't have a lot of Queen's Gambits with white. Mainly he's playing the Queen's Gambit to accept it with black. And he plays Slav and semi-Slav. Anand does everything. Um, but yeah, those were typical games, and white's trying to mate black. And as you can see, sometimes he's successful. Well, I hope you enjoyed the Queen's Gambit Part 2 lecture, where we concentrate on the accepted. Again, we could have a lot of lectures on the Queen's Gambit. There's so many different variations. I want to thank our sponsor, again, Anonymous. Uh, the more you sponsor, the more lectures I give. This is Grandmaster Ben Feingold. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe to the channel and follow my stream and Karen's stream. We stream on Twitch for the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta. Bye, everybody.